Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, in this lecture, we'll be primarily dealing with uh, environmental ethics that is part of the environmental philosophy. And uh, under this, we'll be looking at three specific themes. One is deep ecology and uh, the second is on social ecology and finally on the ecological feminist philosophy. Now. Uh, I feel that uh, the environmental ethics or the e environmental philosophy needs to be included in this course because uh, for quite some time as I have been saying, uh, uh, the idea or understanding of ecology has been limited to only few disciplines and of late uh, there is an increasing realization that. Um, ecology should not be only confined to a particular discipline, but across uh, other disciplines. So, we begin with um, ecological and anthropology perspective and also we have uh, deal with uh, some bit of the sociological understanding of the environment. And uh, in this uh, three particular themes will be again looking at the various strengths of how uh, so called environmental movement has taken place and how it evolved over a period of time. Now, I for the timing I just put on this uh, uh, title as revisiting the philosophy of deep ecology. Now, uh, to make the backgrounds clear. Uh, it is pertinent to actually locate what environmental ethics is and what the sort of debate has been revolving around uh, before going on to uh, what deep ecology is. And in deep ecology, we will also try to look at the binaries between deep ecology and shallow ecology, which has been uh, for qu quite some time in the West at least beginning from uh, America like how it evolved. Now, what are the kind of debates which involve in this uh, environmental ethics? Environmental ethics uh, as I said is a part of this environmental philosophy which tends to you know uh, move on beyond the boundaries uh, which, which was conventionally believed to be uh, solely confined to the study of humans. So, this environmental ethics is an extension which, which tries to uh, you know uh, uh, surpass the boundary or it, it, it goes beyond looking at not just the humans, but also the human the, uh, the non-human world. Now, therefore, it is important to since a study the course primarily deal with uh, the humans and non-human if not the relationship between human and nature. So, therefore, it will be uh, interesting to sort of look at what are the kind of ethics, uh, the sort of uh, controversies and uh, uh, complexities which involve in locating the environmental philosophy. Er environmental philosophies uh, for your information primarily deal with the human nature relationship and it tries to locate the sort of how this uh, human has evolved over a period of time and then it, it tends to sort of uh, looked at how human perceive the sort of relationship with nature or maybe in terms of uh, establishing some kind of 
uh, understanding with uh, or how they deal or utilize the natural resources. All these are in a way being guided by uh, the kind of knowledge which human have uh, perceived over the past generations. So, as times move on, new philosophies evolve and that basically uh, deep ecology is also one of them. Now, if you look at the, the development of this environmental ethics, uh, it is in fact uh, closely linked and related uh, to the growth of this idea of uh, wilderness movement in America. Now, what is this wilderness movement? Uh, wilderness movement in a way have uh, uh, begin with the sorts of intricacies and controversies uh, over the creation of this uh, creation at the same time preservation and extension of this wilderness area that is uh, the, the, the natural resources or nature should in fact uh, be sort of uh, distance if not isolate from the human touch or rather from the harmful action of human. So, therefore, this wilderness movement is again a ploy to uh, sort of uh, uh, preserve the nature in its pristine state. So, this extension of the wilderness areas from the backdrop of uh, the human community or environmental community has examined and also re-examined its ethical responsibilities. What perhaps is the duty or the kind of uh, responsibilities humans or the environmental communities has against these wilderness areas? To, to what extent have they committed if not what are the trends and uh, policies which they have followed in terms of uh, maintaining their relationship. So, when we talk about maintaining relationship, it, it can be sort of uh, both ways, it can be positive as well as negative. There can be sort of injustice which are being catered and done towards the environment in general. Now, if you looked at the, the American culture closely, it, it sort of resembles uh, the system of nas na national parks. Now, uh, if you looked at many of the non-Western countries like for example, in Asia and Africa chiefly, this idea of uh, uh, conservation if not the setting up of national parks uh, has its origin from this wilderness movement in the America. So, what they do is to maintain a boundary or to sort of uh, put the uh, uh, wild, wilderness in a, in, a, in a more confined area. So, that uh, human in return will sort of derive some kind of pleasure if not uh, uh, in, in maintained uh, that sort of relationship in order to derive some kind of satisfaction when they go to the wild. Now, therefore, uh, this idea of uh, national parks has uh, a deep rooted uh, history and its emergence in the context of North America. And uh, you all know like the kind of controversies which is being uh, hovering around even in the Indian context, uh, whenever a national park is to be sort of established. Or maybe if you take the example of uh, conserving a tiger or maybe an elephant. Now, uh, many of the areas or the habitats of humans are being uh, affected uh, as, as, as you all know like animals needs much more of a larger area in order to sustain themselves or to sort of live in that geographical or ecological niche. Now, there, therein lies the 
sort of debates and controversies, if at all one, one is being guided by this wilderness thinking, will it be feasible? If not, how will it be sustainable in the long run? Uh, or, or, or for the sake of this uh, wilderness uh, interest, are, are we going to sort of sacrifice the sustenance of human? So therefore, this debate is pretty much challenged by many of the environmental historians like uh, Ramchandra Guha and then Martinez when they try to espouse and raise the issue of uh, the deep divide between the north and south that is the northern countries and the southern countries. Now, another uh, American historian by the name Roderick Nass and uh, St Stephen Fox uh, wrote way back in 1967 that the history of this American environmentalism is to be contextualized within the debate of uh, preservationists who in a way uh, wish or attempts to preserve nature and other wild species for their own sake. And on the other hand, there is a different school of thought, uh, that is the utilitarians who with the help of science and uh, rational management, uh, sort of attempts to transform nature into a useful commodities, that is by maximizing the utility. Now, you can actually see the two opposing or dichotomies that is the binaries which exist between the preservationists and the utilitarians. Now, this perhaps is something uh, which has been going on uh, if, you, if you try to look at the history of uh, American environmentalism. Now, the preservationist in a way uh, tends to is guided by that idea of that wilderness thinking that is to preserve nature in its own form that is to uh, remain untouched by the human, whereas the other is being guided by uh, that uh, the utilitarian ideas that is nature is nothing but uh, uh, the some sort of it is seen as a commodity where uh, a profit if not uh, to maximizes the needs of human uh, greed, if not humans uh, to serve the purposes of the human needs. Now, for quite some time there has been this debate on environmental ethics and has been a factor which rather relates to nature rather than to culture. So, uh, the cultural aspect in a way is being sidelined if not isolated and uh, nature is uh, sort of the prime concern and the centrifugal in this particular debate. Now, for us to have a much more uh, wider understanding, I will just try to explain what wilderness thinking is. Now, the environmental historian uh, Roderick Nass, in his book, uh, if you look at Wilderness and the American Mind, which was published in 1967, primarily concerns the attitudes of the Americans toward the idea of wilderness. Now, uh, in this book, Nas discusses the different attitudes that humans have toward nature. Now, as I said, there is a differing attitudes and behavior or action people have uh, towards nature and we have in the preceding uh, lectures tries to look at how different cultural groups are maintaining their sort of relationship with nature or how they maintain the natural resources or how they position themselves in the environmental space. Now, over here uh, in this book, uh, Wilderness and the American mind, uh, he in a way tries to present the idea of or the attitude of uh, the Americans that is the Americans are 
rather guided by this uh, anthropocentric view as the main enemy to old wilderness preservations. Now, he tries to depict that uh, this America's anthropocentric view as uh, to be sinned, which is pretty much against the idea of this wilderness preservation. And now, what then is anthropocentric? I'm sure by now you are familiar with the term because anthropocentric or anthropocentrism is uh, sort of the dominant uh, ideas uh, where humans situate uh, oneself in the center of the creatures. And uh, uh, assuming that uh, humans have overriding powers in terms of uh, maintaining certain uh, relationship with nature in general. So, these anthropocentric ideas which is pretty much uh, dominant in the ideas of um, uh, the Americans is uh, again seen to be sort of contradicting with the idea or the interest of this uh, wilderness preservation. Now, uh, if you look at uh, some of the content of the book, uh, Nas in a way uh, strongly or categorically argues that uh, this ecocentric view is ideal and uh, may not necessarily be uh, fruitful and uh, strengthened in the long run. Uh, but perhaps this preservation of nature and wilderness for the sake of holding resources out for the preservation of our own spaces would be more salient. So, in some way Nas was also uh, in some way uh, supporting the idea of this preservation of nature and uh, wilderness for the sake of this holding the resources. Now, uh, as I said this idea of wilderness is uh, antithetical to the utilitarian perspective or ideas of uh, uh, per perceiving the nature. Now, Nas also viewed that uh, this nature appreciation as an indication of uh, a culture's maturity or, or rather uh, this wilderness is, is not to be seen as uh, which is counterpoised to civilization, but is in fact the serious indicator of the flowering of civilization. Now, going back to what we had discussed in the last lecture on how the idea of this uh, the Buddhist principles of maintaining uh, certain uh, uh, attitudes or perceptions towards the maintaining nature. Because in, in many of the uh, classic texts of maybe the Buddhist if not the Hindus there has been sort of a harmonic and symbiotic relationship between human and nature. And it is also interesting to see that perhaps uh, if you look at the evolution of human society at certain point of time uh, even the Indian civilization for that matter uh, beginning from the Indus Valley civilization and it goes on we have a rich history of uh, civilization. And if you look at uh, closely and in a more critical manner in terms of how uh, our predecessors maintained the relationship with the nature that is maybe plants and animals, they do have uh, a written principles or guiding principles of how they should maintain and one as a responsible human being what kind of relationship should be meted out when one deals with not just the forest, but also the water and, uh, and, and what kind of symbolic or significance does it have to the community in general. Now, therefore, it is interesting to see that uh, part of the early civilization which began, which flourished in India as well is something one should uh, tries to locate when we uh, talk about this the contemporary or so called civilization which Nas talks about. Because uh, if 
one talks about uh, the golden period of any kind of civilization or flowering civilization, one can sort of connect with the wild or with the nature and that should not be seen something which is antagonistic to any civilization. Now, many of the as we discussed the utilitarian ideas which are being guided by the scientific and rational management tends to perceive nature as simply which has to be uh, exploited to serve the interest and the purpose of humans. So, that sort of narrow understanding or assumption in a way uh, should not necessarily be considered as something which is uh, to be seen as a modernized if not a civilized society. Now, this sort of binaries which exist that is the <coughs> biocentric and anthropocentric or the preservationist or against the utilitarian if not the imperial. The imperial because many of the colonialist ideas were rather guided by this utilitarian ideas that is in terms of uh, expansion of market. So, the world ha at one point of time has been uh, you know uh, pretty much busy with the colonization of uh, new areas or the expansion of market rather, which in a way is to be seen as different from the expansion of uh, the wilderness areas for those species. Now, therefore, if you look at uh, uh, this the classic polarities of this environmental ethics that is the opposition of utilitarian to the preservationist and also the anthropocentric to biocentric attitude towards nature. As we had already discussed the uh, strong argument which was raised by the historian Lynn White, uh, wherein he talks about the historical roots of the ecological crisis by sort of uh, blaming the Judeo-Christian belief that man was meant to dominate nature. So, this idea of dominating or sort of uh, having an overriding power to exploit the nature is being uh, again guided by as I said uh, the scientific if not uh, the rational ideas of how nature is being perceived. Now, why it is mainly attack uh, uh, the Christians? to in a way relook if not to realize uh, reviving these traditions of stewardship that had been suppressed with their own religion that is the non western religions are believed to be more harmony with nature. So, again Lynn White also uh, compare the present contemporary period with the medieval period how they maintain the relationship with nature. So, by sort of uh, blaming if not uh, hailing the uh, Christians to be responsible for this uh, the ecological crisis, um, Lynn White in a way suggests that uh, one, one needs to relook and reinvent the whole idea and then purposes of one stands in the environment that is one should have that uh, uh, notion of stewardship towards nature. Now, uh, <coughs> the scientific industrialism is one thing uh, wherein is supposedly considered to be the uh, kind of mess or the environmental crisis which we are facing and, and also we had uh, time and again mentioned that. Uh, science and technology is not something which is again to be you know seen to be a way out rather the uh, sort of renaissance of humanity uh, in the future that is evolution is not to sort of uh, go back to the first stage or the uh, first form of society that is to uh, agrarian or the pre agrarian past, but the idea is to you know like restructure and reframe uh, the kind of in uh, industrialist or industrialism and temper its excesses not 
to turn one's back. That is, there is a possibility of uh, you know reshaping and then uh, re recontextualizing the stance of humans in these uh, states. That is, uh, how we you know uh, rectify and reposition ourselves uh, in the spirit of industrialism. Now, maybe we can limit ourselves uh, the kind of uh, environmental problems or the kind of uh, uh, temperament which we have can be limited and then the excesses part can be limited. Now, uh, for example, if you look at the scientific forestry, which, which in a way tends to have uh, you know pose some kind of a hope for the future, but the habits of many lifetimes die hard. That is, uh, again, uh, people tends to you know normally engage in uh, looking or being guided by these utilitarian ideas, and and then sometimes the whole purposes of uh, these ideas of recreating or reframing uh, sometimes dies out. Now, wilderness lovers are in in in, in the are in the main uh, quite hostile to uh, some of these practices like agriculture. Evidently, going back to nature does not imply going back to the land. Now. Uh, Sometimes I feel that uh, this idea of wilderness again is uh, pretty much loaded or embedded with this uh, notion of this romanticism or this romantic uh, notion of thinking by by simply you know uh, allowing us or sort of rather compelling us to go back to the past. So at this point of time, it's not possible for for us to you know. Uh, go back to the past, but all the idea is to reframe and restructure and reposition ourselves in the present context. Now, this dominant environmental traditions, which is pretty much uh, being uh, uh, headed in the U.S., that is the, the Northern America, these free-flowing rivers and uh, natural forests are. Uh, in a way cherished by the environmentalists for their beauty and ecological value. Now, uh, as I said, uh, to what extent uh, the human can remain untouched if not draw certain kind of boundaries between, uh, between uh, this nature and human. Therefore, one also needs to look at the political, economic and sociological background of uh, communities, because there are also communities who are pretty much directly dependent on uh, the environment for their sustenance or natural resources. So, therefore, uh, it is pertinent to look at in a more critical manner, whether as to whether wilderness thinking is really feasible uh, mostly in the third world countries or not, because uh, some of the uh, scholars like as I said Guha and then even uh, the contemporaries they are being uh, critical and then uh, when we talk about development uh, it is also important to uh, look at not just the environment but the human uh, in general. Now therefore the support for many of the national park movement in India comes mainly from the sort of the international conservation organizations and from a class of big game of hunters which in a way sent hunting practices and uh, supposedly turned a preservationist who include many former Maharajas as well. Now in a way this idea of this national park movement is guided by the interest of the elites. Now to what extent the interest of the elites will serve the purpose for the commoners if not the so called middle class which we normally use in the Indian context. Now therefore, this class of interest also something which always time and again crop up and, uh, and, and this perhaps 
again if you look at the scientific forestry as well is being guided by the idea of uh, you know uh, commodification of the forest because uh, many of the uh, wetland if not uh, areas which which doesn't have uh, you know a cash cropping is seen to be a wasteland and again this is guided by the colonialist uh, mindset and, and and we are still not able to when we say we I'm talking about the Indian context that we are not able to really come out of these uh, ideas of uh, uh, the colonialist uh, policies. Therefore, by planting many of the cash crops like the eucalyptus, pine trees, so and so forth, which in a way is uh, fulfilling the needs of the industry, but to what extent it, it really helps uh, to the welfare or the well-being of the communities which are around them, because uh, there are certain case studies which are even being done uh, even in states like Karnataka where they have planted uh, the eucalyptus in uh, a large chunk of areas which in a way has produced the pulp wood which is again the uh, raw materials for the uh, paper industry. Now therefore, this sort of the connivance between the private companies, the corporates and the state in a way has hampered the uh, means of subsistence of the uh, local communities. This are something which we also need to look at when we talk about like the scientific uh, forestry and the scientific forestry at least in Indian context I think is not able to bring a positive result and rather there is a shift towards the community conservation of forests and uh, there is a, an increasing urge to involve the locals in terms of the conservation of uh, forests. So, similarly uh, in, in many of the uh, national parks or maybe uh, any kind of conservation or preservation for that matters there is an increasing realization that uh, the local communities needs to be part of uh, the program and then uh, they should be a stakeholder. So, now uh, these are some of the kind of backgrounds how it evolved and the kind of debates which is to be contextualized when we discuss the environmental ethics or environmental philosophy. Because, uh, it, it has it, uh, its beginning from the north that is the kind of uh, interests of the elites or the developed countries and, and this perhaps uh, has led to the idea of this wilderness movement if not setting up of national parks and then so on and so forth. And then there is a critical engagement uh, which is uh, perhaps uh, done by the environmental historian Ram Chandra Guha when he tries to uh, locate and differentiate between uh, the north and south, because the interest of the north is not similar with the south and uh, as I talk about the political and economic nature which guided the interest also differs. Now, uh, let us let us try to uh, move on to uh, re revisiting deep ecology that why, why is it that deep ecology is important in this uh, present trends and uh, uh, is, is, is there any way out or as we have been talking even in the context of uh, by bringing in religion we are just trying to move on and find out a kind of alternative approach to the environmental crisis which we are facing. Now, therefore, perhaps maybe deep ecology is also an attempt to re-understand and uh, renegotiate or to uh, really look at the human positions and, and how uh, it evolve uh, in, in terms of locating and uh, sort of contextualizing the issues which is pretty much uh, prevalent around. 
Now, uh, deep ecology is uh, uh, perhaps a phrase which is being coined by the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness and uh, uh, his attempt was to uh, sort of find an answer or describe the deep ecological awareness. Now, we, we tend to perceive and uh, looked at nature from a different perspective. So, perhaps deep ecology is also one perspective of looking at the nature that is to what extent uh, the human is able to sort of understand or rather uh, uh, contextualize oneself in this idea of this uh, the natural understanding. Now, deep ecology in a way is uh, found foundation and a branch of this philosophy which is uh, known as eco philosophy. And uh, Arninus, in a way, uh, preferred to use the term ecosophy rather than ecophilosophy. And uh, as I said, he tries to inject certain kind of psychological attributes, that is, the kind of thinking or the notion of uh, understanding which uh, humans perhaps uh, have over the nature or maybe to what extent uh, the ecological awareness is deep rooted or not. Therefore, we will we'll try to uh, bring in this idea of the shallow ecology, because deep ecology again is pretty much uh, uh, antithetical and uh, uh, antagonistic to shallow ecology, because there is a sort of oppositional ideas and understanding between deep ecology and shallow ecology. Now, as I said, shallow ecology again is guided by these ideas of anthropism or anthropocentric ideas or which we can say it is a human center that is situating human above other species. It tends to see uh, contextualize humans above or outside uh, nature and as the source of all value that is uh, it, it, it has some kind of overriding powers or authority and ascribes only the instrumental or use value to nature. So, this is purely utilitarian uh, perspective of uh, commodifying and trying to maximize the uh, value from any objects or any kinds of uh, resources. So, this is something what shallow ecology is uh, uh, ascribed with. Now, deep ecology on the other hand uh, does not draw any boundary between uh, the humans and non humans or anything else from the natural environment. It does see the world as sort of uh, wholesome or a collection of isolated objects, but also as a network of phenomena that are fundamentally interconnected and interdependent. So, deep ecology in a way is more holistic in nature, because it, it tries to espouse that every species or creatures has uh, sort of a stake and then they are they hold an important position. So, no species is to be seen as superior or rather inferior. So, everyone has an equal shared an equal space. So, therefore, that sort of boundaries is not being uh, demarcated. Now, which in a way uh, as I had set the tone and set the beginning uh, the wilderness area or the extension of wilderness areas is not perhaps something which is the answer to sort of solve the problems. Now, deep e ecology in a way uh, tries to establish or it, it, it recognizes the intrinsic value of all living beings and uh, the views human beings are just one particular strand in the web of life that is just a dot or maybe uh, a constitution or organs in the web of relations. 
So it, with, with, in which it cannot sustain and survive alone and, and it needs the other species uh, and, and they are dependent on other species as well. So, therefore, uh, one needs to you know uh, locate and try to understand the intrinsic value of all living beings and uh, it, it, it not just only confined to looking at the utilitarian if not the external values. So, one needs to uh, redefine and uh, see in a much more uh, critical way. Now, uh, the whole tenets or ideas of deep ecology can be uh, situated in, in, in one of the interview with Arnenes way back in 1982, when he says that simple in means rich in ants, uh, which in a way sort of provides a detailed and a clear introduction to the theme of the main ideas of deep ecology. Now, in a way, uh, uh, I'll, I'll partly uh, discuss about Mahatma Gandhi's ideas about uh, the environment, uh, because uh, which which he is popularly known for his quote that the world has uh, enough resources uh, to, in a way, satisfy the needs of human, but does not uh, have enough uh, to sort of satisfy the greeds of humans. So, Arniness was also pretty much influenced by the ideas of Gandhi's thinking in terms of how uh, one situate and contextualize in the ecological niche. So, therefore, uh, simple in means, rich in ends, perhaps might sound very in a very simplistic manner, but then if you look at the embedded or the kind of uh, in depth meaning, it, it sort of uh, requires certain kinds of commitment and sacrifices for the humans, because it is not us who owned the environment or natural resources, but rather we are in a way borrowing from the future generations. We are in a way part of uh, you know uh, trying to en uh, make, make sense or enjoy the current resources which actually do does not belong to us. Now, this simplicity uh, is something which Arnine has uh, always talked about. Maybe if you want to you know like uh, have much more understanding, you can see some of the interviews and uh, the videos on YouTube on Arniness, in which he tends to you know set an example in the later part of his life by leading a very simple and then you know distance from the city or the crowded uh, life, wherein he sort of tries to you know exemplify by setting uh, uh, or living a very simple life rather. Now, uh, Nels in a way claims that this the very essence of deep ecology is to ask deep equations that is one needs to you know not simply questions what one's observed, but also rather questions uh, deep within oneself that is questioning the values of our society and to the development of a total view. Now, uh, rather many of the philosophers if you look at they normally engage in a critical thinking and critical questioning of the society which they uh, live into or which they exist and also the nature of the political affairs. Uh, going on. Now, in this exercise, he discussed the importance of the norms of this ecological equality and self relation. Now, why is that this self relation is important? Because it is the individual which, in a way, adds up and then 
part of the society or, or, or be part of the networks of the society. Now, therefore, it is important to have this uh, questioning and uh, if not the self realization. In, in, in some way, uh, this self realization can be equated uh, by bringing in the Buddhist principles, uh, wherein it also talks about uh, we can be in harmony nature with harmony with nature by being peaceful or at peace. So, one has to be calm and then rather try to understand uh, the intrinsic value of nature and then only that way we will be po it will be possible to maintain certain kind of uh, an e set an equilibrium if not uh, be rather engaged with the self realization now nas father arts that argues that uh, science and technology alone cannot solve our environmental problems and uh, therefore he come up with this idea of eco philosophy uh, it uh, as sort of an alternative. Now, since this idea of this uh, logic can't prove one starting point, people must go beyond this narrow rationality. By saying narrow rationality, we are also talking about the rationality which is again guided by the scientific temperament and uh, reliance on authorities and uh, learn to cultivate and trust the basic institution as a basis for environmental action and meaningful personal values. Now, therefore, this logic should in be in a way inculcated in terms of uh, deriving the intrinsic values of the nature or the objects or anything for that matter around us. So, therefore, uh, we, we cannot afford to really claim that the ideas which were guided by the animistic belief that is the belief that there is a presence of spirits which dwell in a certain plants or animals or any kind of objects cannot be we can't really afford to shun off because there is uh, this connection which has been established uh, among them. Now, as Arninez uh, says again, the issue of, the, issues of uh, the primary purpose of ecology is also to ask deeper questions like, it is only through this continuous engagement of asking questions that is deep questions of today uh, industrialized or maybe any kind of development if not growth oriented or the kind of uh, accumulation of wealth or that is materialistic society that we will force a paradigm shift. Now, in order to have uh, as I talk about that restructuring and repositioning oneself, one needs to engage in asking these deeper questions. Now, uh, one of the simplest thing would be you know by questioning this idea of development which is uh, pretty much uh, common or uh, pretty much Im uh, uh, pertinent in every country or maybe even in India. Now, if you take the examples of uh, say building a dam which is also part of the development policies and programs. and uh, this building of dams again is guided by the Nehruvian idea of development, which again is being borrowed from the West. Now, Nehru conceived that uh, idea of uh, this building a dam as sort of the future temples of India. Now, if you look around the amount or the numbers of dams which is being built and uh, the policy makers normally tends to you know sideline uh, the impact on the certain communities that they are being displaced forcibly and then they lose not their means of livelihood but, and their future is at bleak. So, these issues are something 
which also needs to be you know questions if we go by Arnina's ideas of uh, asking a deeper questions and then we all often witness you know a uh, kind of flood caused by you know the unmindful activities or maybe the wrong planning of the dams and then the submergence of agriculture fields forests and the amount of you know uh, uh, havoc it caused is uh, innumerable. Now, therefore, the sort of ideas has to be sort of challenged and then questioned. By challenging or questioning, the idea of development does not mean that one should shun that way or path, but one has to reinvent and relook. Now, one should not simply be guided by this uh, uh, idea of this the sort of Cartesian solution to the causes of pollution, but to rather probe ever deeper to obtain a holistic view what Nash claims as the cultivation of an ecological self, which also involves a materially simple lifestyles and values that maximize the quality and richness of our experience. Now, for instance, if one always talks about say pollution and, uh, and still engage with you know a much more of uh, a lavish lifestyle of uh, in the flock of cars, owning of them and then which is emitting a lot of carbon. Now, that would be you know uh, contradictory to what Nas talks about that is uh, simple in means and rich in ends. Therefore, one needs to not just uh, look at uh, the bigger picture, but also narrow it down and then uh, the self realization is again very much important in the context of uh, this deep ecology. Now, one of the major con area of concern for deep ecological or deep ecology theories is now being referred to as eco psychology or ecosophy. Now, the eco psychological or spiritual dimensions of uh, humanity's relationship to wild nature, which can be tracked back and ultimately to the primal, pe primal peoples of the world. Now, which means Ness also tries to you know go back and look at because he was primarily interested in the many of the oriental religions like uh, if you you can take the examples of Shintoism or the, uh, the religious practices in Japan and, and could we say that Japan today is uh, uncivilized and backward. No, it, it is one of the most developed countries, but then they still maintained that sort of religious practices wherein they, they do not lose any connection with the environment or nature. So, this sort of ideas uh, needs to be inculcated in terms of uh, you know self realization again is uh, not something uh, which which needs to be seen in the context of the uh, materialistic interpretation, but rather to generate this idea of this uh, the spiritual dimensions of which which particular religions are much more closer and then harmonious to nature. So, this is perhaps some of the ideas which is uh, inculcated uh, in broadly in deep ecology. So, this Nash concept of uh, this self realization as we had discussed that is the ecological self in a way directly link or addresses the key issue of this eco psychology. Now, why is it that there is a re arising interest uh, in the this eco psychology and a concern of renewed sense of connectedness to nature it has it has begun uh, way back to the uh, attention of Thoreau's enigmatic statement that 
in wildness is the preservation of the world that is how one tries to connect and make sense of the world is in a way uh, directly related to this now therefore this the deep ecological movement uh, holds that the health of this natural system should be our first concern so when we talk about we and i that idea of this uh, the self or the human becomes important and which again is different from what deep ecology espouses because that idea of oneself or i is guided by that greed and selfishness rather uh, we should be also equally concerned with the uh, health of the natural system or surrounding or maybe for instance if we continuously engage in dumping you know a waste in a nearby residential area now after a point of time uh, it is going to fire back to us because uh, certain kind of diseases or maybe a plague might occur so in a way this is always an equal reaction so similarly if we are concerned about caring and nurturing the natural system so definitely there will be a healthy environment and uh, in, in in britain it is the uh, human which is going to benefit from it 